was that? Spaceball One. They've gone to plaid. <laughs> with another review. Before we get started, I would like to give a big thank you to the folks over at Bethesda for providing me a review code to make this video possible. Thank you so much. And now with that out of the way, time to loop. Starfield is the next big open-world action adventure that is developed and published by Bethesda. Coming off a recent streak of fun titles they've published, such as Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo, Bethesda decided that it was time to stop milking good old Skyrim and finally create something brand new for the first time in a billion years. But does this title live up to the hype known as Fallout and the Elder Scrolls? Or should they hyperdrive speed away in embarrassment? Only one way to find out, so let's go! Story Set in the year 2330, a distant but still imaginable future where humanity has developed settlements on other planets, step into the role of the main protagonist, who stumbles onto an alien artifact while out in space. After making contact with members of the constellation, they become a part of something much larger, a quest to answer some of humanity's biggest questions. Gameplay where, oh where to begin, this is my first time in a while trying to review a game of this size and structure, so to get through it I'll probably have to wing it just a bit to be able to do the game justice and be as fair and objective as possible for all of its positives and negatives. Sure, I've reviewed monster games like Hogwarts Legacy, a game I dipped into for roughly 70 hours, but Starfield? It's a whole different beast. You hear that? Ow! That's the sound of the beast. When booting up Starfield for my first time, I felt like I was in for a pretty intriguing experience, one I haven't gotten since Elder Scrolls Oblivion. I know a lot of people keep saying this game is like if No Man's Sky, Fallout, and Skyrim had a baby or something, but I couldn't disagree more. To get the pitchforks out of the way ahead of time, I really wasn't a fan of Skyrim. I know, huge cardinal sin! But I found both Oblivion and even Morrowind significantly better. Why? Well, for one thing, I can shoot an arrow into the sky and have it land straight on a poor guy's bald head, or torture the adoring fan by finding intriguing ways to kill him, like running him over with Shadowmir, who I accidentally lost locking him inside one of the Oblivion gates while he was wearing the $20 horse armor. Oh yeah, I was pissed. Adoring fan, man oh man, how I enjoyed hiding your body under a bridge and knocking you off mountains. Good times, good times. But we're not here to talk about the adoring fan or Oblivion, even though he is actually in Starfield 2 and just as annoying as ever. As I was saying, people tend to compare Starfield a lot to Skyrim, when to me, the game's structure-wise and fluidity leans more to the way Oblivion plays, for better or for worse. Because believe me, there's plenty of better and for worse to go around in my experience with this title. Going into Starfield and starting the game up, it felt like through the hype of it all that there were some pretty high expectations for it, especially when compared to previous entries into Bethesda's IPs, like The Elder Scrolls and Fallout, and now being a brand new IP, the pressure is and was on. From the get-go, you will notice a bit that Starfield might not exactly revolutionize how action role-playing games shape themselves, or even that it pushes the Bethesda formula either. 
And honestly, that's okay, because even if it doesn't completely flip the genre on its head, it still achieves it by adding the normal formula, tweaking it, and executing gameplay and exploration that is on a pretty intense scale and scope. In the vein of titles like No Man's Sky, in its current state, yeah, you knew right away I didn't mean when it launched, didn't you? All those false promises and every word being no to features in the game. Yikes, it was a mess. No. Will you be able to play with your friends? No. After you start your game and create your character, remember one thing. Traits matter. A lot. And I mean a lot. With some even affecting features in the game, and whether you can witness something your first playthrough or not, a la the adoring fan. Yes, that's right, folks. That annoying little turd brain is locked behind a trait skill that you can only pick at the beginning of the game. And if you don't pick it as one of your traits when you start, tough cookie kid, no adoring fan for you. Sadly, this happened to me, so what did I do? Well, because my sadistic side of me loves torturing people in games like Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures, when I beat up that smug face of his, or again, messing with the adoring fan in oblivion, long story short, he got what was coming to him. But enough talking about conduct that would get me in trouble if gaming followed the rule of the land with the Geneva Convention. Let's just talk about the dang game already, alright? Good. Here in Starfield, the game commences with you as your created character being employed as a miner on a far distant planet, being taught the ins and outs of labor on how to acquire resources by using your cutting laser, one of which will be vital to keep as your journey unfolds in order to mine rare minerals and even story-based items with. But of course, you know stories like this. It's never just super easy, right? While you're mining your way through caves, you unearth a strange and celestial-like enigmatic artifact that has become not only a mystery to the rest of the galaxy, but extremely rare. Upon touching this artifact like you've been dared to touch the butt like in Finding Nemo, your body has a vision. Is it the future? Is it the past? What did you see? I can see the future! After going through this transcendent-like experience and trying to come to grips with the power that is now flowing through your body after touching the artifact, now the true adventure begins when you are approached by Barrett, a member of an exploration organization known as the Constellation. Choosing to join this organization is when the main story officially begins and you enter the vast universe of Starfield. One that offers cosmic exploration, mystery of the universe's past, meeting new friends, foes and allies, romance system, in-depth character and ship customization, and a story that may start slow, but ends with a revelation that things are much bigger than they initially appeared to be. That's what she said. What? Once you're fully introduced to other members of the Constellation and make your way to New Atlanta City, a city that left me in awe with its scale and how amazing it looks, you're handed an astronomical amount of freedom minus story-based system that you can't get to just yet because you do not have an upgraded ship capable of hyperdrive to make that leap to ludicrous speeds. But when you do, oh man, it looks pretty dang awesome. I cannot stress enough the sheer scale of this game at its core. By opening up your galaxy map screen, you're able to see the map system based off of galaxy you're currently in, with 3D models of the planets and their moons, or closer up view of the star system itself, which allows you to go along set paths of star systems to immediately hyperdrive warp speed to it. However, with a slight catch, you need the right amount of fuel to make that jump, and your graph drive upgraded either via using your ship's skill points to raise levels of your shields, missiles, lasers, by manually adjusting your levels. All of these are key to use together because you will get attacked while in space. But luckily for me, I'm better than Anakin Skywalker and showed everyone that this is pod racing. Take that, you slime ball! Okay, no, I'm sorry, you know me in driving. It totally didn't end like that. Ah! When you first begin moving through the main game story, at first it may seem a little bit too straightforward. Hey, we got the coordinates of where this artifact is. Take your ship, warp to that area, and bring it back so that we can add it to our piece of the puzzle in the map room in the Lodge HQ in New Atlantis. But no, it's not that boring, trust me because you aren't the only ones after these ancient artifacts that hold mysterious powers. Nope, because there is another group of people that are after the same thing, seemingly divine beings known as hunters and emissary, both of which also have their own plans on how to use them, for better or for worse. Traversing through the story, you will go across the vast universe seeing landmarks of New Atlantis, which is a thriving tech city. 
Aquila City that is in a barren desert who get by any way they can as they live their daily lives fighting off Hold hordes it. of monsters. Of Neon monster. City that is steampunk and rave-filled lighting that is home to some of the most dangerous people in the universe, as well as the most potent drug named Aurora, this game's version of Skuma. Neon City is probably the place where I got myself into the most trouble just because of that drug alone. During your playthrough, one of the missions in Neon City requires you to try to acquire some from a local nightclub and manipulate your way into a deal with other clients. Which, I have to say of the nightclub, this place is wacky as all heck. Everyone dancing their booty off to club music with three aliens on a platform in the middle of the room that took me way off guard at first when seeing it. But the bigger the reasons why I got into trouble, well, I kinda sorta became Walter White and got arrested for drug smuggling. Oops. A mission you acquire at one point wants you to infiltrate an opposing organization to learn their secrets and find the traitor who tried to ruin your company. Easy, right? Well, kind of. That is, until I was like, Jesse, it's time to cook. And instead of doing the job I was hired to do, I instead got active ingredients for crafting and used the work machine to create more of the drug named Aurora. My batch was 99.1% pure, the best in the galaxy. Say my name. However, I may have forgotten that I had it on board my ship and was scanned before entering a neighboring star system and was immediately arrested and thrown in jail. Oh well, at least it wasn't a STOP! You have violated the law moment like in Oblivion, but I did have my moments. Even when you're not getting into mischief like me, there's still a large quantity of quests to do that go beyond your normal storyline campaign. These are having to do with quests that are picked up from NPCs by just walking by them and having them initiate a conversation with you, which you can't ignore their dumb butts, but still get the quest. You also have faction-based quests that allow you to join with the UC to police the galaxy, become a free ranger and help people in need, join pirates called the Crimson Fleet if you wish to be a jerk, etc, etc. All of these and more have their own long-running quest line that's in the vein of stuff from what you remember with the previous Bethesda games like the Dark Brotherhood. What's intriguing about getting arrested in Starfield, though, is the way it's actually done and orchestrated. No longer will you just pay a fine and serve your time in jail, but instead, you're offered a deal by the UC themselves, saying all your criminal activity charges will be dropped if you agree to work with them as an undercover UC agent to infiltrate the pirate organization known as the Crimson Fleet and take them down. Should you not agree, well, the book is thrown at you and to jail you go. I absolutely loved this take on the arrest system because it felt just like it would in real life. People getting cut deals by corrupt leaders in order to achieve their goal. And the questline is actually pretty dang fun too. Miscellaneous missions are also good ways to pass the time should you want to focus more on exploration and smaller themed quests, such as going to planets and investigating an old refuge for someone who hasn't heard back from their friend in a while, find and dispose of pirates named Spacers who loot and kill, help citizens of Aquila set up security systems to protect their town, explore vast ice planets, desert planets, rich green forest planets, and even find Earth, a now dead planet that has become a ghost of its former self. Aw oh, man, no more little Caesars? That sucks! But the real reason to do the miscellaneous quest is to find the secret temples of an ancient civilization that houses secret powers that only you can unlock. By using your scanner to sense abnormalities, collect power sources to activate the portal, and then collect your power. These powers range from creating a gravity force around your body that lifts enemies in your area into the air with gravity, faster dash running, gravity and force pushes, etc. There are so many of them, with each having their own unique purpose. It sort of reminds me of the power system used in other Bethesda published titles like Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo. Back onto the actual planetary exploration though, such as ship docking, dogfights in space, ship management and upgrading, landing sequences, etc. You're probably going to hear a billion times about how comparable to games like No Man's Sky that Starfield is. Whether it's stepping foot on an alien planet for the first time or cruising through space, you might get a bit of deja vu, but only to an extent, because a place where the comparison stops is its real-time landing on the planet. Here in Starfield, you cannot fly in real time and go into the planet's atmosphere and then land. Nope, instead you're thrown into a landing sequence with cutscenes showing you heading towards the planet and then the landing sequence cutscene right after. For me, it's not really an issue, because while it can take you out of the immersion just a little tad bit, it makes up for it with things like docking, dogfights, and management. Wait, how the heck is docking interesting or fun? Well, for many reasons actually, especially when dogfights and docking are used to coincide with each other. For example, as you fly through space, you will get communication transmissions from other ships in your area, 
Some are nice and need your help to get their ship running and will ask you to spare some parts, or allow you to dock with their ship to go on board their ship and fix their ship yourself. However, others aren't going to be so nice and will flat out attack you, thus making you have to defend yourself by manually raising your ship's meters on the left side of your ship's console for missiles, lasers, and shield energy. You can use your ship's default settings to raise your levels, go to cities to purchase parts, or find rare parts by looting in order to raise the levels of each usable part of your ship with its power and design. Which, again, links directly back to dogfighting in space like Star Wars. These dang dogfights can be freaking intense as all hell, sometimes even frustrating when you're trying to move and fly around to get them in your sights, but then you can't see them and start having your inner Star Fox moment screaming at them, cocky little freaks! So, uh, what does that have to do with docking? Simple. When you dogfight, you will be able to steal the other person's ship, should you have the ability to. And the same holds true for any ship you find when you're out and about adventuring. Exploring a planet and seeing a person land in the distance, go say hello to them like the friendly person you are. Or murder them in cold blood and piss off your wife, Andresia, like I did when I was trying to romance her. She got so pissed. I'm sorry, Andresia. No, don't be mad. We'll hide the body together! Will you help me hide a body? I know what you're thinking. So it's kind of like GTA in space. And, um, yeah, I kind of guess it is. But you don't have to be a jerk like me and steal ships, because rare ones like Razor Leaf are found as rewards if you find one raiding a pirate base or officially purchase them from ship terminals, which becomes mandatory to do mid-game. So all that is cool, right? Basic mechanics of flying, docking, powers, quests, all really good stuff. Heck, even the dozens of wow moments or holy crap moments you have during the main game's story that throws you for a loop are awesome and genuinely engrossing. But what of the main form of gameplay, such as the combat system, skill management, and leveling system? Well, like other Bethesda games you have played in the past, gameplay-wise, your missions involve you visiting designated destinations and locations highlighted on your map screen albeit way more streamlined and easier to navigate on Starfield. These remain a constant like usual, however, with some major tweaking to the enemy AI with your gunplay. Combat with guns is smooth as ever, feeling quick, flashy, and impactful as you craft new upgrades, use gravity to jump and float over enemies to do a cool shot kill, using environment to move from enemy gunfire, and so forth. Combat is more of what you'd expect with a Bethesda game, but again, more streamlined. Fluid, and the use of powers you get from finding powers at temples or by upgrading your skill sets with attributes that can give you more carrying capacity so you aren't encumbered and run out of oxygen to move better in your spacesuit, ability to stealth for pickpocketing, more health and weapon damage, increase in dialogue skills for better persuasion, making your ships stronger by unlocking skills related to your ships, and so on. But for me, what sets this game apart from previous Bethesda games as far as combat goes is the enemy AI this go around. Sure, it's still not perfect with some enemies being dumb as heck and getting lost or stuck in a wall, but overall the AI feels much more intuitive and is much more aware of their surroundings. Should you be on a floor above them shooting down on you, usually they'll stay behind a wall and shoot back over and over. But in Starfield, they will strategically move around to find the best spot and even try to flank you if you aren't careful. These suckers have gotten smarter. Clever girl. On top of the skill points to boost player abilities the further you level, ship management and flying, powers to give yourself an edge, faction-themed quests for organizations, miscellaneous quests that let you help out civilians in need, smooth as butter gameplay mechanics that gives you freedom to come up with your own way to play using powers, plus gunfighting to form combination attacks. Even beyond that, would you believe we still have more to talk about with the game's mechanics? Oh yeah, I can just hear Lamb Chop singing now. This is the song that doesn't end. Yes, it goes on and on, my friend. GNC started reviewing it, not knowing how big it was, and she'll continue reviewing it forever just because. The last mechanic I wish to talk about, and one that I've spent hours upon hours on, is the companion and dialogue system that is in the game. Here in Starfield, dialogue options that you pick matter, whether it's persuading an NPC into de-escalating a conflict by scaring them or negotiating, persuading them or failing in the dialogue tree and having to go the route you do not wish to go with in relation to a specific character. When initiating a conversation with an NPC, when you're trying to gather information or throw your weight around, you will operate on a karma system that gives you three chances to make good with an NPC before they get mad and attack you or blow you off completely. So what's so karma about this, and why does it matter? Well, because you can totally take off your waifu without even meaning to, of course. 
As stated just a minute ago, you have a companion system. This system allows you to meet and recruit people either from Constellation themselves or from people you meet in your galaxy to join your crew. And once they're a part of your crew, you may allow up to two to four people to ride on your ship with you depending on the ship's size, send them to outposts for defense that you built on distant planets, or select which companions will accompany you on your missions wherever you may go. Bringing them along is now where the karma system comes into play. Whether you bring along Sam, Sarah, Barrett, Andresia, etc., doesn't matter who you bring along, each character has their own personalities and likes and dislikes based off of the actions you take in and outside of dialogue. For example, Andresia is a hardened killer who kills who needs to be killed. She's sassy, blunt, and likes intimidation. However, she does not like to hurt innocent people. She hates it. As you go on missions, side quests, or just journeying with your companion, you'll be able to converse with them and eventually strike up a conversation that boosts your romance meter, eventually leading into a scenario where you can marry them, if you're lucky enough to win them over with your actions. It's easier said than done, but it also actually works really well since the AI for your companions allow them to interact with you during your journey, find items for you, wear the gear you give them or weapons, and even respond to dialogue that you're having with an NBC and giving their own input to the situation at hand and listening to your every answer. Should they dislike your answer, they will let you know this and dislike your action, further ruining your reputation with them. And should you anger them too much, they will not want anything to do with you and leave your party as a companion and ally. Oh my goodness, this was so stressful. I started winning over Andresia well into the 50 hour mark of the game before I started messing up badly. Killing people she didn't want me to kill, make decisions with dialogue that was too nice and not intimidating enough for her liking, and even getting into the fight with the Neon City police and scaring her off completely. Eek! Luckily I had an autosave. I just loaded it back up and was a lot more careful. I was that close to losing 50 hours of work on her character. I would have been more rageful than that kid that got his World of Warcraft account deleted. <laughs> Point being overall, that Starfield for Companions adopts a nuanced approach compared to traditional karma systems, and this time actions are evaluated on a greater level, which allows you to be more immersed in your experience with a character as you learn their history and watch as they contribute to conversations and adding additional dialogue options depending on their skills and personality traits. Dislikes. Uh-oh. Yeah, it had to come to this. Nothing is perfect, and that goes for Starfield, too. While there are many aspects that make Starfield amazing and range from stuff like its graphics, freedom, and scale of exploration, fluid combat, great story narrative with twists, while that's all good and dandy, there are quite a few gripes that I have issue with that range from small problems to bigger ones. Firstly, in regards to the companion system, while sure it's really good, there are issues that stem from options of dialogue repeating itself that can make your companion feel like a robot from time to time when they provide input for a mission. Sometimes what they talk about in their dialogue does not pertain to what is currently going on in the mission itself, making things off-putting and giving you a chance to ruin your built-up karma with them. It's no Baldur's Gate 3 of dialogue, but it is what it is. Second gripe is some of the bugs I've encountered. What? Bugs in a Bethesda game? I'm utterly shocked. <laughs> Sarcasm aside, strangely enough, this is one of the least buggy Bethesda games I've played in some time, which is insane given the scale of this title. But when the bugs do hit, you feel them. During my ventures to get powers in the sacred temples, both companions would clip into walls and spaz out like crazy all over the place and couldn't move until I either left the area or went through the power portal. On top of that, sometimes when you're in space picking your next target to warp to, the mission icon keeps showing up on planets that the mission doesn't even pertain to when you're just trying to jump to another star system. This gets frustrating and annoying really quick, especially when you're fighting with the game glitches and then immediately get attacked by a higher ranked ship than you because you took too long to get away. Last but not least are some of the major things I encountered during my playthrough that were more drastic than others. The game's frame rate at times and game crashing. During runs to Aquila City, I noticed that the game seems very resource heavy in this particular area, so much so that you start feeling and actually see a significant frame rate drop that makes your characters and the screen stutter every now and then for about 3-4 to four seconds. But what makes it even more jarring is that if you open your menu when you start hitting some frame rate drops, your entire game will freeze completely and do one of two things. Boot you back to your Xbox dashboard, making you lose progress, or completely lock up your console completely, making you have to hard reset. 
These lockups happened to me in both Aquila City and Neon City. Did it happen a lot? No, but the fact that it still happened is still an issue, and a big one to me at that. Overall, at the end of the day, Starfield achieves a high rank in accordance to the role-playing genre of open-world games that makes it stand out from the rest of the pack. But it's also not without its fair share of disappointment, like a touring fan being locked behind a trait you can only get at the start of the game, frame rate dips, game lockups from time to time, some dialogue options, repeats for companions, bugs that involve character clipping into the wall, etc., etc. However, with a back-and-forth narrative that keeps you engaged in the story, top-notch gunplay mechanics, dozens of skill set abilities, and ancient powers to find and equip, extremely in-depth ship management system that lets you customize your ship by size, color, and individual parts, awesome companions who are well-written and have great backstories, Star Wars feeling space dogfight that make you want to take Andros down, and the sense of adventure for an open-world game of this genre that you will have a hard time finding elsewhere this year. It's simply a fantastic game, flaws and all, and one that you definitely need to play if you have an Xbox series or capable PC. You definitely won't regret it. Well, unless your wife or husband is waiting upstairs for you, but you're in the middle of killing pirates, so you give them the old two seconds from the Shaun of the Dead and ultimately ruin their night. Do not do that for your own safety. So with all that having been said, my verdict is clear. Game & Chick says bye now. Stop right there, criminal scum! Nobody breaks the law on my watch! I'm confiscating your stolen goods. Now pay your fine, or it's off to jail. Then pay with your blood! Please, Khajiit stole nothing. Khajiit is innocent of his crime. Yes! Oh, great and mighty Grand Champion! Is there something you need? Can I carry your weapon? Shine your boots? Suck on your nipples? Perhaps. <laughs>